Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. Um, I am so excited about this guest that I'm about to have on. Um, I just want everybody to know that, you know, I started engaging the restoration uh, through the Community of Christ had a, a book club. And uh, there was about, a mem about 100 people that participated in it. And then as a result of me basically talking at every one of, every one of these meetings, asking questions about Joseph Smith III, which was the book that we were talking about, um, I started getting invites from other groups, subgroups. One was for a group called the Book of Mormon Expressions Forum, which I participate in every Monday night. And the other was for this little book club. And so here is this evangelical interloper uh, that gets this invitation to join this book club for uh, post-Mormons and nuanced Mormons. So that's how I met my next guest here, uh, Rebecca Gleason. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. And so that's how we met. And so I've been participating in this little group, which is very active. They have some wonderful people in it. Um, it's a very diverse group. And it was it's really an honor to be kind of like this evangelical, this fly in the wall. I try not to do too much talking because I kind of like to hear the, the different voices. But Rebecca was the co-founder of this book club. Now, we're going to talk about the book club. But before we get to that, I actually want uh, Rebecca to tell her story because I talked to her the other day. And I said, you know, let's do something about your book club. And then you started telling me your story. And I'm like, let's talk about your, your story. And then we'll talk about the book club. That kind of be a side thing. I think it's more important in many ways to tell your story. So uh, Rebecca, let me ask you the first question. And that is, were you born in the covenant? Absolutely. Yes, I was. I'm pioneer stock through and through. <laughs> so, so you're, you were born in the covenant and just tell us a little bit about your childhood and your background, uh, what kind of family you were raised in. I grew up in uh, Washington State, the southeastern corner, and my parents were very active LDS, so it was all my extended family, and they were avid genealogists. My mom did it professionally, and my dad did it um, part-time, but in addition to everything else they did, they actually had their own microfish readers. Each of them had one in the basement. So that's the sound of my childhood, the whir of the microfish reader. Maybe you don't know what that is, Stephen, but for genealogy records, you would get these machines that you could play them on and you turn a handle. So it made this little whirring sound and they each had an office and just constantly do gene genealogy. So um, that's kind of my background as far as the orthodoxy that I was raised with. Um, we didn't have TV until I was a teenager. We ate a lot of food storage. It was a pretty Mormon Orthodox uh, upbringing, more than any of my friends. Hmm. So, so was there a lot of Bruce M. McConkie uh, books and stuff like that? Yep, they were absolutely Birch Society, McConkie, and Skousen was a huge influence in everything that I learned when I was a kid. So, okay, so now what yeah, did you this come- This was in the 70s. So yeah. a, a lot of kids I think had the same experience. Yeah, yeah, that was like the height of a lot of that stuff. It was the height of a lot of it. Yep, absolutely. So all the stories about the 10 tribes being under the ice and you know all of that kind of stuff that and now a lot of people say, no one ever says that, but I lived through all of that. Did your, fam five, did your family have an altar in your house? No, there was okay. nothing like that. <laughs> okay, I know <laughs> some definitely. still did. Well, we did have a lot of like wheat in buckets. So we did make furniture out of that. Uh, other Mormons will back me up on this. You put the food storage and then you put blankets over it. And then that creates like things to sit on. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that's fantastic. No, I just want you to give you a little background because I come from an evangelical background, but right. my parents got up uh, really up into the whole end time stuff that was happening in the seventies as well. Well, so yeah, like yeah. The, the most sold, most sold book in the country in the 1970s was called the late great planet earth by hell Lindsay. So oh. many evangelicals believe that the end of the world was coming. So my parents had food storage. I remember as a little kid seeing yeah. the food storage in the, in the garage. So I feel like I have this connection to a lot of people growing up in that, yeah, it's, around that time it was the 70s what are you gonna do <laughs> i mean I, I look i look back at some of the hairstyles and the outfits there were and it it, it did look like the end was near <laughs> yeah it did it did i agree <laughs> so um so yeah that's the background that you're in and um you it was it was really interesting because it you you're from this orthodox family um how was your faith like what did you view your faith in God and the church, what, what, what was your relationship to it at the time? Yeah, I would say that I have never been a magical thinker, if you understand what that means. And so from a very young age, 
I never really understood what anybody else was talking about when they talked about the spiritual element of things. I didn't feel that way. I was very logical. I was a critical thinker, even as a child. I remember a memory, gosh, I think I must've been four or five, where my dad had me put my tithing in an envelope and take it to hand it to the bishop. And I did that. And then I remember saying to my dad, now, how do we know he just doesn't take that? How do we know he just doesn't go buy something at the store? I mean, <laughs> I just did not ever catch the vision um, of what everybody else felt uh, or why they were there. And so it was very confusing to me during testimony meetings or any kind of meetings when people would cry and they would emote and they would express, including my own parents. I had no idea what they were feeling. So wow. my, my husband says I'm a Vulcan. I would probably stand by that. I am. <laughs> but even from a child, I didn't ever understand it. However, I was in it culturally and stayed in it, of course, because I didn't know what else to do. So you go along, your friends are all LDS, you're doing the LDS activities. Back in those days, it was an all-encompassing thing to belong to the church. Like there was an activity every night or a function, the welfare farm, the family history center, you know, young men, young women called mutual back in the day. I mean, it really was a completely immersive lifestyle. So I lived the lifestyle, but without really having the component where I understood why I was doing it or believed what I was doing, if that makes sense. So how did you, how did your baptism go? Did you get baptized at the age of eight? I did get baptized at the age of eight, and it's the first time I remember lying in a bishop's Rick's interview, in a bishop's interview, um, because, <laughs> and I don't know how I got this in my head, but a couple days before, I had held hands with a little boy. I was eight, right? His name was Nathan. I remember this distinctly. We had held hands, and I remember sitting in front of the bishop and knowing that I probably wasn't worthy to be baptized because I had done that. And so when he said, do you feel ready? I think is what they said. I remember distinctly going, well, I'm not, but I got to say yes, because there's a lot writing on it. So yes. <laughs> and I remember that extremely clearly. The first time I recognized to survive here, I'm going to have to budget the truth a little bit. So that was interesting. And then back in that day, you were baptized on Saturday and then you were confirmed in front of everyone, you know, on the stand the next day. And so I distinctly remember, I don't really remember being baptized, but I do remember um, being confirmed the next day because I did have one little, I thought, you know what, what if something big happens? What if this is the moment where I, you know, feel something because everybody described that I would and I'd seen people emoting these feelings and I remember sitting there and they did the prayer and I remember looking around and going huh <laughs> nothing I got nothing <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was interesting those are you know very clear memories from age eight that's that's what that's very interesting. So so as you're growing up, you're fully immersed in the culture and everything like that. How how was how were your high school years? What oh, was, it was that like? I had a big group of Mormon girlfriends, and we did everything. We went to all. It was much more social back then. It was much less locked down and strict. There were dances every weekend. Every stake, every ward had something you could go to. You could bring friends who were not LDS to the dances. It was just, you know, it was what you did. Just like I said, plays and road shows and parties. Um, you hear a lot of Mormons my age lamenting those last days where it was just so fun. Our young men, young women activities were let's go to the river, let's go water skiing. I mean, so who wouldn't want to be a part of that right with all the kids you know doing that and now I know you have to have very specific purposes for activities you know they have to have a spiritual element or a purpose that was not really the case back then I think they really understood we just need these kids to be together we need them to have a friendship and camaraderie and that's the most important thing so yeah it was wonderful it was absolutely wonderful so your relationship with the church vis-a-vis -vis your social life it sounds to me like it just was fantastic for you I mean, of course, on Sunday, as soon as sacrament meeting was over, I would run to the bathroom to try to hide so I didn't have to go to Sunday school. My dad knew to look for me there. He would mm -hmm. come into the women's bathroom, drag me out, take me to class. I mean, you know, all the antics that kids did. So I never was on board with the study or, you know, being involved in that way. But I certainly did like the social aspect of it, for sure. Yeah, we're, and we're going to circle back to that anxiety that you felt at church, because I think that's an important yeah. part of your story. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... Um, you end up attending BYU, correct? 
I did. I ended up going to BYU. All my friends went there and I never thought I'd do anything differently. That's the thing. When you're in it, you basically are being pulled along by a force that you don't have any control of. That's just what you do. And you did it. And, and so, the, of course I did. And your expectation was that you would also find your husband there. Is that, was that your personal expectation? I kind of, I kind of assumed because especially back in, back in my day, if I can say that, that's how you're raised, that you're going to, you're going to get married and you're going to be a mom. You know, you can go to school and pick something that you might be able to fall back on, but you're definitely um, looking probably to get married. So and what did you study? Um, I, well, this, this is interesting. I started out in advertising because I love to write and that creative aspect of all of it. But once I got into the program, I was like, wow, there's so many really high powered guys in here. I don't know if there's room for a girl. I definitely fell victim to that. Oh, I better pick a major that's a little more female friendly, if that makes sense. And so I became a humanities major with an art minor and a Latin, almost a Latin minor. And then when I finished that, I went into library and information science and I got my master's in that. So I went to school for a long time. I didn't get married till I was almost 26. So, whew. and no, I did not serve a mission because there was nothing more terrifying to me than going and knocking on a door and talking to somebody about something I didn't really understand <laughs> or was behind. And by understand, I didn't mean, I don't mean everything about it because I was very well versed in Mormonism, but understand why anyone would join is yeah. kind of what I meant. So I just, I, I, let's talk a little bit about your time because you, you were in school till you're about the age of 26, but you actually started working in the, the BYU library system. At I this did time. As, a student, as a student, and then once I graduated and got my master's, then I was on staff there and working um, in a department where I cataloged books. So. And you and you were with the BYU Library for you said about fifteen years, correct? Yeah, yeah. I finally uh, went home to be with my little kids in the early two thousands. I decided my husband and I decided to, I'd go home and be a stay at home mom. So I finally semi retired in about two thousand one. So as your time spent as a librarian, they were switching over from the Dewey Decimal System over to the Library of Congress system. And so that led you to into some interesting areas. Talk a little bit about that. Collections they did. Um, there was a reclassification project for some old, old Mormon Americana. And those books were still in the old classification system and we could work overtime to move them, you know, up into the Library of Congress. And so that was kind of my first exposure to these old, dusty, old, old books, um, Mormon literature, Mormon history. And of course you're cataloging them. So you're looking through them and you have to look in the index and you have to see, you know, what, what topic you're gonna catalog them as. And as I started reading those, boy, uh, the things I was reading in these books, that was not the church that I was part of in the 70s, and it certainly wasn't the church I was part of in the late 90s. Um, there was some very interesting information I had never read before, and one of the pivotal things that I found is I found my founding Mormon ancestor, the one that had joined the church back in the day, direct descendant, same last name as my maiden name, I found out that he had played a pivotal role in the Mountain Meadows Massacre. <laughs> And no one else in my family had ever said anything about that, um, or I don't think knew anything about that. So um, I remember photocopying some of the pages from this book that explained his involvement. Um, I got a copy of the federal arrest warrant for him. And I took these things to a family reunion as a young adult. I think I was probably about 22, 23 when this was happening. And I thought, God, my family's gonna wanna know about this. This is interesting. And when my dad saw what I had, he said, take that back to the car. You know, we're not going to talk about that. And that's when I first started to realize, wow, there's, there might be a lot more going on here than I understood. It's not just that I don't really feel anything. There might be some other things at play here. So ironically, it was, it was working at the BYU library that I kind of got more of an education than I expected, if that makes sense. Wow, that's really interesting. So were you ever a believer in like the Book of Mormon or any of that kind of stuff growing up? Uh, there, it was always there in my life. In fact, it was talked about in such real terms that I remember distinctly when I was a little, little kid that I thought Parley P. Pratt was a member of our ward. I mean, that's how 
how just nonchalantly he was discussed at our house. I thought he was a real person. You know, I didn't realize these were characters in church history. So of course I, I knew all about that. It was a part of my life, but I never gave, gave much thought to where it came from or what it was. I just knew that I didn't understand why people were getting up and crying about it all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't, you know, I read it. I was in seminary. I, I did all the things everyone does in seminary. You know, you don't, you don't finish reading everything you're supposed to. And so you cram it all in on the last day and say you read, you know, I did all of that. And, but um, I just, it's uh, maybe hard to explain. <laughs> so, well, and, and part of the reason I asked that question was, is that as you're encountering these books and the, as you're, you're going through them and you're studying and you're reading and you're finding this alternative history that you weren't aware of, what did that do to you at the time? Well, it's funny because a lot of, I know a lot of post-Mormons now, and mostly when they hear information that's different from what they knew before, they'll say, oh no, and they'll wrestle with it. Anytime I hear something, I go, I knew it. <laughs> that's my attitude. I'm just, I knew there had to be something. I knew there had to be a reason I was feeling that something was off. So to me, it, it just confirms kind of what I've always felt since I was a child. So, wow. yeah. and I'm never surprised by anything I hear. So that is that is so interesting. One one of the things that I think find fascinating about your story, and one of the, one of the reasons I want to have you on, is that you've had so many unique, if you will, strange things happen mm -hmm. to you through your you, through your time as a, a church member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. And I want to go back to your college years a little bit because mm -hmm. you actually got yelled at by a general authority while you were a college student get yelled at by a general authority. I know I, for some reason, seem to be a magnet for just these very unusual experiences that I just leaves you scratching your head. But when I was in college, I did get engaged and um, the young man had not gone on a mission yet. So he didn't necessarily really want to go, but he thought that my parents would never approve unless he did. So we went through the whole process, got the call, went into the MTC. I told him I didn't carry their way, but he knew, he knew my parents, you know, probably would not be on board so he went to the mtc and a couple weeks later he just decided I, I can't do it i'm not here for the right reasons which kudos to him right not a lot of people have <laughs> the nerve to do that and be true to themselves so he left the mtc it was right when school had started this was in the 80s and his family called me and said we have disowned him we would like you to disown him so that it will force him back into the mtc and so I, of course, said no, because that's absurd, you know, but they cut him off. They cut off money. He had nothing. He thought he was going on a mission. So I helped him kind of find an apartment. He got a job. He started working at night, trying to go to school, pay his own way because he had no family support. Well, the family had a connection, of course, to a general authority. And so they made arrangements for us to go and talk to this general authority in his office in the church office building. And so I kind of thought, I was sort of like, oh, good. We can explain our situation and our story. And we can kind of tell him that, you know, this young man just doesn't feel in his heart that he wants to go. And, you know, maybe we'll get some guidance where to go from now. So, you know, I did not expect, because still there was a lot of um, hero worship when I was growing up of these men, you know, kind, wonderful, amazing, which I'm sure a lot of them are. <laughs> but in this situation, so we go into the office, this massive office, and this gentleman is sitting behind this massive desk, you know, and we sit down in these chairs that in my mind, they were lower than normal chairs, you know what I mean? <laughs> so we're kind of like that. And, and he just, you know, he was aware of the situation. He knew why we were there. And he just right away, someone must have told him, try to put the fear of God in him because he just started, you know, really lambasting us. And he said to my boyfriend, he's like, how are you ever going to face, you know, Noah and Nephi and, and, and Lehi and, and David, you know, he named all the, you know, how are you going to face these people when you die and tell them that you couldn't serve a mission? And my poor boyfriend was like, oh, and then he turned to me and he goes, how are you? And then of course he was struggling to find women names in the scriptures. How are you going to face, you know, he was trying, uh, what was her name? Esther, uh, you know, named a couple of names, you know, and I just remember sitting there being just shocked. You know, there was no constructive discussion. There was no, how are you guys? This must be rough. You know, what are you feeling? What's happening? There was none of that. It was really just a uh, Bible thump, you know? And so we walked out of there and and this incident happened before I was working at BYU, but it was another incident where I was attending, but not where I hadn't looked at the books yet. Um, it was another incident where I went, aha, 
yeah, there's some, there's something, there's just something here that isn't quite right. You know, it's just, there's just an unkindness. So it was, and, but ironically, this young man, he's still an active Mormon with a great family and in a ward and, you know, he's been active all his life. So it didn't have too much of an impact on him. I think maybe he felt he sort of deserved it in a weird way. So, mm. but I was really upset for him. You know, I, I really took exception. So now, was that like the first time you ever had something strange happen to you or were there things? Oh, from no. your... I, we could be here all night talking about the strange things. that happened. Tell, tell a little bit about maybe something strange that happened in your childhood or younger years. <laughs> And then we could talk oh, about some other stuff. Oh, well, okay. So one time they used to have temple trips um, where you'd get on a bus as a youth and go to a temple if you lived far away, which everybody did back then because there wasn't one on every corner. And you would get on a bus and um, you'd go to the temple to do baptisms for the dead. So one time I got on the bus, I was 14. I think it was the youngest you could go back then. And one of the leaders grabbed my hand and she goes, you have nail polish on. And I said, yeah, she goes, you can't go in the temple with nail polish on, you know, you're going to have to go home and take that off and you're going to miss the bus and you're going to have to ride in a station wagon with the leaders. And that's exactly what happened. I had to go home to wipe the nail polish off my hands. I had to ride up there in, you know, humiliated in the station wagon facing backwards, right? If anyone remembers that back in the day uh, with the leaders. So I'm just saying things like that all the time that just make you go what? <laughs> but I just went along and did everything. You know, I didn't, I was just kind of, I wasn't even that upset. I was just like, this is interesting. So hmm. but yeah, I had a lot of unusual things like that, that would happen. So I once had somebody tell me that, um, a member of the bishopric told me I was too tan when I was an older teenager and that <laughs> it was immodest <laughs> because I was tan. So and then he encouraged me not to wear white until I could let my tan fade down. So I know it was the eighties. Seriously, every every girl has a, has stories like this where you're just like, "What the heck?" So yeah. So you then you mentioned to me that you actually had another kind of bizarre temple experience where somebody accused you of something uh, of being something. No, every single time I've ever gone, I've had a very strange experience. And I realize now that I hear other people discuss it, that I, I have anxiety around um, church or worship or especially the temple. I don't have anxiety in other parts of my life, but in that, it seems like I really do. So um, I've had a lot of strange, every time I've ever gone to the temple, which is very few, I think maybe like five before I just said, I can't do this to myself anymore. I've had some strange experiences. So um, the second time I ever went back, um, I had not, you know, I was brand new to the temple. So Tom, my husband, um, when we went in, he goes, oh, let's go down this hallway on our way to the session. And I'll show you what a ceiling room looks like. Cause you don't know. And we're going to get married in two weeks, you know, cause you can't, you don't go in. You don't know what a ceiling room really looks like, you know, back then, no internet, you can't Google what it is. So we kind of tiptoed down the hall and we kind of peeked into a ceiling room and suddenly this temple matron threw herself in front of the door and blocked the doorway. She goes, get out of here. And I'm like, what? <laughs> she goes, I know what you guys are. She goes, you guys are polygamous and you're trying to break in here and you're trying to do a ceiling. And, you know, I'm just like, what is happening? <laughs> it was so stressful. And my my fiance now husband is like, no, 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 ma'am. We're getting married in the temple in two weeks. And she's new. She doesn't know what it looks like. She goes, no, you can't fool me. You guys are polygamous. You know? So we just, we just took off. And I remember Tom going, no, it's okay. The temple's not normally like this. It, it's okay. <laughs> this was too much. It was too much. So, but I'm telling you every time, one time we were after we were married, we were sitting in the lobby of a temple on a regular bench, just sitting there, Tom and I together. And all of a sudden, a temple worker came up to us. And, and this bench was kind of on the side where there are locker rooms, a woman's locker room and a men's locker room. And so we were kind of sitting on it on a bench in the lobby on the side of the women's locker room. And the temple worker comes up, and she goes, sir, to Tom, I can see you peeking into the women's locker room. He goes, you're going to have to move. I can see that you're peeping into, <laughs> we're both like, no, we're just sitting here. He's like, I'm with my wife. We're waiting to go in. We're not, 
we're not peeping into any locker room. She goes, sir, you're going to have to get up and move. You know, So we did because it was so insane. And again, it begs the question, if you were to peep, what would you see? So, <laughs> but I'm just telling you, just, just strange experiences. So the last time I ever went was probably in 1993, I think. Yeah. And I went to a ceiling for a family member and I came out and everyone in the family started laughing at me because I had my dress on backwards. <laughs> the, dress, the big zipper was at the front. And I just said, I literally give up. I give up whatever it is that I'm supposed to feel here. I don't feel it. And it's just been one nightmare after another. I mean, I guess if I'm sharing, I may as well tell you the, so I took my endowments out. That's fine. Then I went back the next time. And when you take them out for the first time, they tell you if you need help during any part of the ceremony, you can ask for help because you're new. So the second time I went back and I got to a certain part where I needed to repeat something. And I whispered to the woman, I'm new and I need a little help. This is only my second time. And she said, what? You're not supposed to be here. You, she is not supposed to be here. I don't know how she got in here. And she called over some kind of other people. They shut everything down. They, I think she couldn't hear what I said when I was just asking for help, but it was absolutely humiliating. You know, I finally had to explain. I said, no, 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 I'm just new. It's my second time. I just need help. I don't know what to say. I, I'm supposed to be here. I went through all the right. I got in. I'm here's, here's my card. You know, it was, it was absolutely traumatizing. And so I, I went through to the next section where you're supposed to sit there quietly. And my husband was waiting for me and I was just, he goes, Oh, don't you want to sit? I go, get me out of here. <laughs> you know, it, it was absolutely traumatic. And I actually think there are a lot of people that feel that way. They might not recognize it, but the temple doesn't make them feel great. There's a lot of performance anxiety that goes along with it. So well, and I but still, I just went, that's okay. I'm still in the church. I just don't like the temple. That's all right. Okay. That's kind of how I looked at it. Yeah. You looked at it, but this is, and this is kind of one a, a key into how you alluded to it as when you were younger and then your experiences within the temple and then other aspects of the church that basically outside of church, you were well-adjusted. You were very comfortable in your own skin and all that but when it came to the time you would spend in what you could call holy places within mormonism you experience a large degree of anxiety so talk a little bit about that yep absolutely just i mean i would i would say for anybody that's an kind of an introverted extrovert, which I think I kind of am, um, it's difficult because just sitting there at church, any second you can be called on to pray or to teach or to, to lead music or to, you know, just, or have an interview, or there's just so many things where you may be called upon to do something that you can never relax, at least for a person like me, it's very stressful. In fact, I've been in wards where they have a Sunday where they've given you a talk to prepare ahead of time or a, a talk to read, and anyone from the audience can be called up to speak. I mean, absolutely terrifying, you know? And I didn't really have that problem in any other aspect of my life. I run organizations and programs, you know, in school and stuff, PTA, have no problem addressing large crowds, but at church, I just shut down. And I think it's because I was never comfortable with what I would have to talk about. I've actually kind of arrived at that's what it is, so. So as you, you, you decided that you, weren't really getting a whole lot of your church experience. So at some point in your marriage, you and Tom decided that you wanted to maybe experience other expressions of Christianity, primarily their, their, their music and their worship. Maybe yep. explore that a little bit. Talk a bit about the process of what led you to that and what you experienced in that. Yeah, probably in the last, gosh, maybe 10 years, just kind of realizing it wasn't exactly there at church for, for us, especially music wise, my husband's very musical. Um, we started to see, well, what else is out there? So just for fun, even though we were still going to the regular Mormon church and had callings in the mornings, we would go to other Christian churches to experience the music and, you know, just what, see what it was all about. And we loved it. It was amazing. The one thing I really liked a lot was, um, listening to the stories from the scriptures um, from the Bible. You don't hear that a lot in Mormon meetings. You hear the Book of Mormon. So it was really fun to be able to listen to those stories. Um, the pastors, of course, were paid clergy. And so you get a really 
amped up intellectual experience, which we loved. I mean, it, we found ourselves talking about the lessons we had learned that Sunday all through the week, which we never did, you know, at church. So it was amazing. And we even took it as far as we joined a, a black gospel choir. That was really fun together. My husband's still in it. And so we just went all over all kinds of different experiences and then still would come back and, and fulfill our callings and our duties in our regular um, LDS ward. So we figured if we just mix it all up, you know, that then somehow within all of that, we'll get what we needed. So even though we weren't even sure what that was, but so we really, really enjoyed it. How do two white Mormons end up joining a black gospel choir? I know. In well, and what's ironic is the choir is a, the choir is an LDS black gospel choir. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So, and there's a, there's all kinds of people in it and it's really, it was really interesting. So wow. yeah. And my husband's still in it actually. So, so. it's an LDS black gospel choir. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. is, that's just fantastic. Yeah, it is. And so, and, and is it like when they sing, is it like a traditional Black Baptist uh -huh. choir sings? Yeah, they do that. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, like we were performing, they performed for, um, they performed for several different things in the, in the um, conference center. That's what I'm trying to end. You know, they do, I think they performed so they perform at President Nelson's birthday. They performed at the B1 um, thing to celebrate the um, change in the priesthood and the anniversary okay. of that. So yeah, they go all, go all over performing. So one of the things that's so fascinating to me, because part of the, the reason I am doing this channel is I like the, I'm trying to find overlap in my world, evangelicalism or right. Protestantism and the restoration. Right. So I, I just want to give me a little bit of feedback about visiting other Christian churches what your overall impression was of them? What did you go to evangelical churches? You know, what kind of churches did you go to? And just kind of give me an overall assessment of what it was all about. I mean, we went to some Baptist churches, we went to some more evangelical churches, and we actually ran into lots of LDS people anywhere we went, you could tell, because they looked really uncomfortable and they were dressed in church clothes, but they were there, you know. So there was there's quite a number of people. Um, I'm in Utah now that like to go around, you know, just kind of looking to see what else, what else is around. So, but I just just, um, I love the music and I love the fact that sitting there in the audience, nobody was ever going to ask you to do anything. There was absolutely no stress or pressure. You know, no one's going to ask you to lead a song, give a talk, play the piano, say a prayer. You just get to sit there and completely focus on being present in the moment, um, listening to the Bible stories and, and listening to the music. And, and the speakers were all really good. Like I said, paid clergy, it makes a big difference. <laughs> It was very inspiring. So yeah, we really enjoyed it. So did you ever like talk with the pastors and kind of? Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah, we did. We'd go up at Tom's very much like that. My husband, he, we went up afterwards and met everybody. And Tom even joined a couple of their choirs, I think. And so one of my favorite ones, one church we went to, we went to a Christmas Eve um, uh, church meeting you know, because Mormons don't have that, which I think is too bad, because it's fun to celebrate that side of Christmas on Christmas Eve, and then, you know, have the more Santa on Sunday. Uh, we went to a Christmas Eve celebration, and, and um, you know, they did a whole nativity, nativity presentation, and then from the back of the room, this cart was wheeled out with cupcakes and candles, and they said, let's all sing happy birthday to Jesus, and I was just like, this is the greatest thing ever. There was a cart of cupcakes coming down the aisle and we're singing happy birthday to Jesus. And it was an amazing, just Christmassy, happy, wonderful experience. So wow. I loved it. I still remember it. It was several years ago. Wow. Well, that's great. I, I, I'm so, I think it's so cool when people like you do that, you know, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Independence, Missouri, mm -hmm. and I was um, attending a, uh, a, a group of it was a restorationist service, so it had representatives from four different re restoration groups in it, including LDS and some uh, Church of Jesus Christ, Community of Christ, and some independent people and stuff like that. And um, I didn't wasn't expecting it. I came to the service a little late, but I get there and the apostle asked me to do the closing prayer uh -huh. at a restorationist service. <laughs> I don't think there's been too many evangelicals. That done no, that. that's amazing. Yeah. But there's no reason not to. That's what I learned too, is that, every, you know, everybody's a human being, everyone has different beliefs and why not share and appreciate what everybody has to offer. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. And just so folks know, I mean, there was a professor from, from BYU that was in attendance of that meeting. So it, it wasn't just some fringe group, you know, right. so it was, it was pretty cool. And, and so I love that, you know, I love being able to reach out to people 
And, you know, I, I, I spoke at a Book of Mormon rally and I had regular Christians. This is interesting to me. I actually had like three regular Christians who are charismatic, who are believers in the Book of Mormon and they have nothing to do with Mormonism. Uh, yeah. I love it when you bring those kind of people out of the woodwork that don't, yeah. we don't normally meet. So I'm so just, I'm so, I'm blessed by that you guys were blessed by my movement. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. And I'm glad that it's played a role, some somewhat of a role in your life. Absolutely. It absolutely has. In fact, uh, over Thanksgiving, we, <laughs> my husband is kind of a Joe Olstein fan. <laughs> in fact, when he teaches gospel doctrine, he doesn't now, but he used to, he would always bring in Joe Olstein quotes and he would call him Elder Osteen. He would say, as Elder Osteen says, and no one caught on, like nobody caught on. We never had anybody ask if he would always say that as Elder Osteen says in this particular, you know, and they fit right in. So we've been to Lakewood Church before and uh, Tom, he's really good at getting in where he needs to go. He jumped a couple lines and got us right up there to meet Joel Osteen. And he has the most amazing hair I've ever seen. Like if his bodyguards weren't there, I wanted to just, you know, but again, just a so different from Mormonism when you attend something like that, you know, everybody's smiling. This is something that you don't see a lot at, I just, the, if anyone goes out and attends something else and comes back, you'll just notice the difference. There's just a difference. People look very duty bound sort of, um, in LDS churches. I don't see a lot of smiles and maybe that's just me, but, and maybe because I'm not smiling, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. But yeah, so we're going to go again over Thanksgiving um, in Houston. We're visiting family and we're going to go again to the Lakewood Church. It's just so fun. The music is so awesome. So. Wow. So you're going to go see Elder Osteen. Yeah. That's pretty. Oh, Elder Osteen. Yeah. So we're still mixing it up. We'll just say that. We're still mixing it up, which is great. So so, so folks, I think there's been a lot more cross pollinization going on than we're aware than even I was aware of. There is, there is. People see what everybody else is doing and they say, well, those guys look really happy. What are they doing? What are they learning? And what do they know? And so it's excellent. That's great. Um, and then I just wanted to, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the book club, but I just, did, I, you did start a group uh, like gospel praise where you did like did. praise music in your yeah. home or something. Yeah. Talk a little yeah. bit about that. My husband is also, um, he kind of DJs on the side, like a wedding DJ. So we've got a lot of sound equipment and karaoke equipment and music and stuff. And like I said, he loves to sing and he would talk to people when he taught gospel doctrine and, and talk about, he would always, he'd even bear his testimony about going out to other churches and talk about the music and everything. So some people in our board <clears throat> would say, well, gosh, you know, we, how can we experience this kind of music, you know? And of course they probably weren't to the point where they would go to another church, but we decided to have, we called it the get your praise on gospel sing-along in our house. And we'd invite people over and we do Christian karaoke and we'd have a message and we'd just sing. And oh my goodness, people love to sing. It was just so fun. COVID kind of stopped that, but we've had a few people say, when are you going to start that up again? So it, it was really fun. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. You guys seem like you're just remarkable people doing unique things. And I love it. Um, I, I want to talk about the book club, but as we, as I'm thinking about it, I just had one last question about when you were doing the research in the library, was there a particular book that you encountered that sticks out that really maybe shook you or, or made you like, Oh, I knew it. No, that's a good question. I think um, more than more than those old dusty books, you know, it was just kind of reading through them and just, you know, I remember reading something about blood, oath, that kind of stuff, blood atonement, you know, and, and Adam God, you know, stuff I hadn't really heard of before and going, this is so different, you know, but then it's kind of pre-internet almost. And so there's really no way to actively search it out. I do, however, remember that I started cataloging dialogue, the Journal of Mormon Thought, that periodical, mm -hmm. and that, you know, a little more modern started reading some of the essays in that. I especially loved Eugene England and all the things that he would write. And so just reading that just kind of broke my mind open a little bit that there might be some other ways to think about Mormonism. And there certainly were other people that were thinking out there how to connect with them. I didn't know, like I said, pre-internet, but I understood that they were out there and they were thinking and that things were different than I knew growing up. And you know, there was something going on. So tell us about the Good Book Club. Book Club, yeah. It's kind of a pun on the good book, right? I hope you got that. <laughs> so anyway, as I became more of a sort of shifted more to post-Mormonism, I um, 
I started getting more involved in the social media side of it, you know, different sites and connected more with other people that are, you know, having kind of more of a post Mormon world. And I noticed, especially on some of the Reddit threads, um, on some of the different post Mormon groups, um, post or nuanced, I'll say, um, but everybody was becoming a voracious reader. They were just reading and reading and they were posting what they were reading and there were all books about every single topic. And I think uh, someone in our book club, uh, Melinda from Utah, uh, said it best when she said, um, now we know what we don't believe. Um, now we need to find out what we do believe, you know? And I kind of got the sense that things had been locked up for people. They had not known they could study all these things. And I'm not just talking about Mormon books. I'm talking about history, philosophy, science, you know, humanism, everything. So I was kind of keeping lists of all these books that I was seeing posted on, uh, as I looked at different threads and went to different social media sites. And then I started posting some things about some books and then some people started responding. And, and I made a joke about how, oh, I have a library science degree. And somebody made a joke about, well, why don't you start the first post or nuance Mormon book club? And I laughed and I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting idea. And then some people I'd never met before that were just on Reddit, they started saying, well, I could help with that. I could do that. So we definitely had kind of four core founders, you know, one was a techie guy that said, I can help you set up Zoom meetings and I can help you do this, you know, and this is all COVID. So there's nothing else going on. So we just kind of did it. We came up with a book list and we threw it out on Reddit and we had probably about, I think, 15 people at our first meeting. And most of those core people are still with us today, which is amazing. Um, and we just, we meet monthly, um, virtually, and we just, we have a book list that's voted on by all the members, uh, categories that are chosen. And we read the book throughout the month. We discuss it on a Facebook page, you know, chat back and forth about it. And then we have a, a meeting, a virtual meeting where we talk about the book and we let different people in the group host the meeting, you know, kind of take control of the discussion. So you get all kinds of different perspectives and points of view. And we have people that have never been Mormon in it, which they're just fascinated. Sometimes they're horrified. <laughs> like when we read Blood of the Prophets, their eyes were like this, what? <laughs> So, but we, and we have people at all different levels. We have people that both husband and wife are part of it. We have people where only one spouse, you know, the other one is still in the church. We have people that are kind of, one of our original founders who helped me set things up, he's never been able to attend because he's in a mixed faith marriage and he can't let them know that he's involved with anything. So he checks in every month in a while or says, oh, I saw your post, but he's never been able to attend because of his circumstance. So we have all different kinds of people. Now, um, what, um, how long has this book club been going on for now? It started last August, so it's been over a year now. Okay. Yeah. The first book we read was Free Will by Sam Harris. And I'll tell you, in fact, I even brought, I brought some notes. Um, we, we have different categories. We're not just reading Mormon books. We're trying to, we're trying to realize what we, we're, like I said, what we don't know. Now we're trying to find out what we do know, what we do believe. And Mormons, I think sometimes feel there's a lot of catch up there, right? Because we didn't read things that were considered maybe not going to be in alignment with what we were being taught. So for example, our reading list this year, our categories are Mormon history, science, mindfulness and spiritualism, humanities and social science, human interest, human sexuality, philosophy, Bible history, world religions, and Mormon studies. So we choose a book um, that we feel fits under each of those categories. Um, so far this year, we've read Blood of the Prophets. That was quite an experience if we have time to talk about that. And um, we just finished 1491, an incredible book about what America was like pre-Columbus. And uh, for November, we're reading a book by a Christian pastor, um, Kathy Escobar, that's called Faith Shifts about when your faith changes and what that feels like and, and how to navigate that. So, um, we try to pick just a variety. And like I said, it's always voted on by our members. And every discussion is just amazing. Uh, we talk for like two hours. And then I kind of took a page out of the LDS handbook and I created a mix and mingle afterwards. So we literally stay on another hour to talk because a lot of the book club is about connection um, just through reading and discussion. And it, it's just been amazing the people that we've met and the things that have happened. It's been pretty incredible. So, um, folks, just to let you know, I'm going to be leaving a link for uh, to for the Good Book Club, uh, so that it's a private club, but and uh, they have access to it on Facebook as well as Zoom. Um, 
uh, you know, what was really interesting to me was, you know, I, as I, part two of my interview with uh, Don Bradley will be released this Friday. And um, in it, I kind of talk a little bit about my faith journey where it kind of parallels Don Bradley's faith journey, who um, went from Mormonism to atheism, ultimately back to Mormonism again. Okay. Well, I kind of had a similar thing because, you know, I, I, I would have identified myself as an atheist at one point. Okay. Well, what I found so fascinating about your group was when I joined the group, I was able to go look at all the books you had been reading. I'm like, well, I read that one. I read that one. I read that one. I read that one. And, and so, and so many of the times you guys are having a book discussion, I, I read the book maybe 10 years ago, you know, but I thought, okay, this is where they're at right now. You know, I'm not saying you're going to end up, you know, all these people in this group are going to end up back in Mormonism. But what I'm trying to say is, is that I was in that same journey, reading these same books getting educated on all these topics that I felt like I wasn't told the whole story about my faith and about history and, yeah. and, and science. Um, so, you know, I was like, okay, well, I need to be part of this group just because I kind of like, I've been there with, I've been there. I'm at, I was at that point at one time. Right. And, you know, sometimes I have to be careful about some things I say because I don't want to upset people or they're in a different, you know, they're right. maybe they get tr triggered. You know, I don't yeah. want to come across as being too, saying too many nice things about right. Joseph Smith, where I'm actually like singing praise to the man almost. And then somebody gets triggered. So I'm so always right. so careful and cognizant of that, the, the, the process that people are going through. So talk a little bit, that was a long winded question, but I wanted to give a preface because um, talk a little bit about what the, what the uh, book club has done for the individual members, maybe helping them in their journey. Oh yeah, well, I think I think it might be helpful if I read our mission statement that we came up with. We read this at the beginning of each each um, each meeting, and this just kind of uh, kind of explains our philosophy and what we're trying to do. So our mission statement is: uh, the Good Book Club was created to bring together nuanced and post Mormons who are introspective, critical thinkers seeking to learn, connect, and build relationships through the catalyst of literature. And that's kind of the key right there. We welcome all who are searching for a safe space to share authentic thoughts, feelings, and ideas through open dialogue and shared experiences relative to Mormon culture. As we deconstruct previous beliefs, we encourage all to find happiness in the process of discovering new religious ideologies, spirituality, and life philosophies. So that's kind of it. Anybody can come at whatever point they're at and we can just talk. And we've had all kinds of different people from people that log on and start crying and say, I had no idea there were people out there that felt like I did, you know? And I think um, there's a concern that some people who are post-Mormon are very angry, you know? And, and there's a lot of post-Mormons who don't want to be angry or maybe are a little, uncomfortable around a lot of anger, even though that's a very valid emotion that you have to work through in it. So this, you know, we don't really have that here. We just talk about books and we talk about it, you know, the catalyst of literature and our shared culture of Mormonism, and we just talk. So it's very cathartic and interesting. And I'll tell you, when we pick a book for the month, you kind of live in that book for the whole month. Like you think about it and you find things about it and you notice things that are going on. When we read uh, Blood of the Prophets, Will Bagley's book, I was talking to him just a few, I mean, I was, I was playing phone tag with him right before he died. He was supposed to uh, come in and answer some questions for the book club, but he was, you know, too ill. So, so sad about that. But we actually went on a field trip with some of our book club members down to the Mountain Meadow site. And we be, we zoom beamed, that makes me sound really old. We <laughs> broadcasted a book club from the Mountain Meadow site, you know, for everybody else. Um, and we have members all over the United States. I should say that we have people and all different professions, just such a diverse, uh, diverse group, which makes it really fun. Everybody's experiences are just welcomed and, and certain books resonate with, with some more than others, you know, and you'll just see when one, one month somebody goes, oh, I, I'm an astrophysicist. I know exactly what this science book is talking. You know, they, they just, everybody has something to add, which is just incredible. So it's been amazing. It gives me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great that you're doing something that's so unique and so interesting and giving a safe space, if you will. Uh, yeah, to yeah, people. Exactly it. Um, I also, uh, in addition to talking about your book club, I just wanted to let the audience know that this next month in November of 2021 
is going to be the Thrive Conference. And you're going to be having a booth or a table there. So talk a little bit about that and then maybe what you anticipate going to Thrive is going to be like and and, yeah, and then how I, you're able I've to never, get the word out. Yeah, I've never been to Thrive before. Um, some people in the book club have been, I think pre-COVID, they didn't have it last year. So, but I just kind of thought, oh, this would be interesting. I contacted them and asked them if they thought we would be a fit as far as just getting out some information as a community resource, you know, community support kind of a thing. If anyone's interested in reading good books and talking to like-minded people. And so they just offered us a, a booth there um, at no cost, just because we're, there's no monetary component to our book club we're just simply reading books and you can join and you know stay as long as you like and and so we're going to have a table there um, where we can just talk to people and kind of tell them what we're about and tell them how to join if they're interested so look for us there yay and john delin's putting this on and you told me john delin is a member of the book club is that correct he's a member of the book club he's never attended because he's so busy but he definitely you know reads our posts and he'll like things and stuff like that but yeah he's he's too busy to read so <laughs> yep so, um, so that, and, and when is the Thrive Conference again? Um, what, it's going to be the 14th. Yeah. The 14th. Okay. The 14th, and yeah. So it's just one day. It's not like a weekend long thing. Yeah. Oh, and I'm sorry of next month, not this month. The 14th of November. Yeah, Sunday in November. Yeah. Apparently they have events all the time, all kinds of, you know, things going on, but the actual conference where people, you know, meet for that one day is on the 14th. So, so, um, just real quick, we didn't address this. I want to talk a little bit about your mother of three, correct? Exactly. Yeah. And, and you, um, you to, to maybe talk a little bit about what it's like to be a post Mormon <laughs> mother and yeah. what that means as a parent as well. Yeah, no, it's interesting because I do, I have three boys Um, two are, they're young adults. The youngest is a senior, um, two are post Mormons and one is a very active Mormon. So, you know, and we're all living in the same house right now while everybody's going to school. So it's very interesting. But uh, yeah, we all just, you know, there are things that we don't discuss because it can be upsetting sometimes to, you know, some people. And I also, of course, uh, feel very much my role as a mother and I'm not going to say anything that's upsetting to a child. You know, it's interesting when you're a post-Mormon, you, you know, and I'm on the other side of it too. I have my own parents, you know, that I visit at a state and I don't say anything to them either. I don't want to make anyone uncomfortable or, you know, impose any views on anybody. So we can all get along. I feel that we all can. And and that's just kind of, you know, it's maybe a little bit of a tightrope, but you just you do it. <laughs> you know, I just want to point out to the audience when we both uh, hopped on Zoom tonight, we did not coordinate our our outfits. We are kind of matching. I like yes. it. <laughs> it. It worked out very well. And you know I just <laughs> What's that? We could go to prom. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure Tom wouldn't mind. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, and and so that's really. I I got reached out to you the other day, and I was like, you know, we need to talk about the book club, and because I want my audience, like, well, I do a book review channel. Of course, there might be people. Now, this group is for like we talked about earlier, is for nuanced and post Mormon type kind of people. Um, it's not for everybody that's in my audience, but I know there's a lot of people that might be interested. So I'm going to provide a link um, to the Good Book Club. And um, and so if you feel free to join, you know, it's a private group. And 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 I don't want it to get too big because you want to have intimacy, but you also want accessibility for people too. Exactly. You know? And like I said, not every book is for every person. So every month we have, you know, we kind of have a core, but then we have people that, you know, jump in and out or say, this is my favorite book. I want to discuss this. Or they'll say that book didn't really grab me. So I think I'll pass on that. But it really is more than books. It's discussion with like-minded people. So if it sounds, you know, if you feel like-minded, it's a, it's a good space to be in. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. Um, you know, Rebecca, I, I just want to thank you so much for, for, for coming on to my program. And I was just wondering, do you have any, like any final words for my audience? Oh, let me see. Well, first of all, I have to sing your praises. I mean, he was one of the first, I think, when did you join? Maybe like two or three months in. I mean, it wasn't too too long in. And I remember your message to me um, on Reddit where you personally messaged me and you said, hey, uh, do you let anybody into your book club who's not a Mormon? Because I'm an evangelical. And I said, oh my gosh, <laughs> this will be awesome. Anybody. So, and at that time you said, yeah, I'm I'm thinking of starting some kind of a channel. I might want to try to get a few interviews, you know, and I'm like, well, that sounds incredible. And, and to see what you've done and to see the people that you've had on your show, 
it's just all of us in the book club who follow your journey we're just our minds are kind of blown we just you know when you got Richard Bushman who we had just read Rough Stone Rolling we were like what <laughs> so yeah so I just you know have to yay for you it's amazing and I think it's great because you like I try to do in the book club bringing just all kinds of people together just to talk you're doing the same thing you know all kinds of people from all different religions and all different lifestyles and and it's 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 greatly needed I think to bring everyone together so I say clap for you that's awesome clap for you and your book club there we go it's a mutual ad ad admiration society Yay. absolutely so folks I just want to thank again Rebecca for coming on to the program I want to remind you my own. what you called me the acronym yeah yes this well, oh, oh segment this i'm the first one tell them what you called me <laughs> well so well i called you uh i, I mentioned to you that i have i'm having largely unknown guests coming on my thursday night slot and you were like i'm a lug a lug <laughs> well because when you asked me i said oh my goodness i know who you have on your show i why would you want me you know and you said oh no it's fine i'm gonna have a segment where i have largely unknown guests and i said I'll be your first lug. There you go. Yeah. And, you're, and the first one we call, there, we, we've had others, uh, other lugs as well, but now we know what to call them. That's and so right. thank you. So we're going to have lug yeah. Thursdays, I think we'll start calling. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. That's fantastic. So we have our own acronym now, our own language for the channel. So uh, thanks again, Rebecca. And I just remind my audience to like and subscribe and make sure you hit the notification button to be reminded when a new video comes out. I want to let everybody know, starting later this fall in November, I'm going to be expanding to Tuesdays. So I will be doing three episodes a week. Um, I'm really appreciating all the... Uh, feedback I'm getting from people. I got some great, awesome guests. You're going to be shocked. If you think Bushman and all that is amazing, you guys are going to be shocked if some of the other people are coming on. So I'm just so excited. Rebecca, keep up the good work with the book club. Keep on doing what you're doing. Keep the dialogue going. And everybody, we're going to get through this uh, whole uh, epidemic. Uh, just, you know, use common sense, wear a mask, get vaccinated, all that good stuff. And we're going to get through this together. And uh, Godspeed.